Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it'll go into effect March 1st of 2020. Um, so it is a ban on what looks like all plastic bags. Um, and part of that legislation is for from an advocate side. One of the big issues that we face is that about a dozen municipalities in New York banned plastic bags. And what happened was that it didn't really change consumer behavior. What ended up happening is that people just switched to paper, or they just switched to slightly thicker reusable bags. But they didn't really start bringing their own bag in the same way that we've seen um, in places like California, where they have the ban on plastic with the fee on paper. And so we pushed very hard at the state level to also include a fee on paper to incentivize reusable bags. And there was a compromise reached where we didn't get the statewide paper bag fee, but they're allowing cities and counties to put a five cent fee on paper bags and having the money go to an environmental cause. So um, one of the big issues is that uh, a lot of places like Suffolk County and New York City when they tried to do it, um, and Ulster County that are trying to implement uh, fees on paper, money has to stay with the store unless you get what's called state enabling legislation that lets some of the money go to an environmental cause. So now for the first time, we'll be able to send out money from those nickels from paper bags up to the Environmental Protection Fund. So hopefully that'll push some cities and counties like Westchester that have been a little bit reticent to move forward um, now that there is sort of the option that they're going to get two of every five of those cents back to use for education. It might push them. Um, whereas even um, there's been a couple plastic bag bills in the county for the last few years, and they've been very controversial. Even in sort of the legislative environment committee, there's a lot of pushback against we don't want to nickel and dime people to death, um, and hopefully that'll change a little bit now. Um, and to be fair, even if it doesn't change, I think that in places where they just have the plastic bag ban and you just go to the store, you see everybody switching to paper. Um, so even if we don't pass it by March, by March 1st of 2020, I have no doubt that a lot of cities and counties are going to push forward after that once they see that it isn't as effective. Um, I also just want to plug, Westchester is about to ban polystyrene, styrofoam sorry, sorry, containers. Yeah. Yeah. So they're holding a public hearing uh, on May 20th in the evening, if anybody's free and wants to come and testify, if you want to do some local activism, it'd be great. Where? Um, in their legislative offices in White Plains, it's on Martin Avenue. Um, yeah, and then for the bottle bill, uh, this would expand the nickel fee that we currently have on stuff like carbonated beverages and then more recently water to all beverages. Um, and the point is to increase recycling um, rates. It's been one of the most effective laws we have. The bottle bill it was implemented in 90, 1993. We've seen really fast litter reductions, um, but we're still sort of only halfway there because we have all of these beverages that don't have the fee on them. And I know we've been talking a lot about plastic, but one of the big issues for us with all waste now is that China is no longer taking our recyclables. So things like glass that we don't have any infrastructure for recycling here, we were just shipping over. Um, and even for things like the number one and two water bottles and things that uh, previously we've been gave, getting a lot of money back for, they were really lucrative, we're now paying to dispose of in some cases. So one thing that'll happen with this bottle bill is that it can help sort of uh, create local infrastructure getting going so that we can do things like, for the first time, recycle glass, hopefully. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to help Rob. We will, uh, any information about opportunities for people to advocate with the county or, or other programs that are coming up that are related to this topic, we can post on social media and send out in our follow-up email to, to all of our members, right? Susie, yes. <laughs> so, so, so you'll have the, uh, the information for what's happening on May 27th. Um, so, I will just tell you, just if you don't want to be the first person, you're probably going to want to be the last person to ask a question, so don't be shy. Um, I will just turn it over to you then, Deborah. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, your studies are, whereas Jordan's more focused on some of the public advocacy work we were just hearing about, the work that you're doing is much more uh, about scientific research and talking about the, the microplastics, which is a little harder for us to wrap our heads around because it's not, it's not as tangible for us as, as changing our behaviors or understanding legislation. So tell us a little bit about perhaps what the story was that um, was recently included in National Geographic, referring to it. 
Well, I, um, I had been doing a lot of research on microplastics and um, what it was kind of serendipitous that a seven year um, collection of small marsh fish um, was about to be thrown out and um, the study that had been intended for those fish um, was complete and they were informal and, and kind of, you know, stinking. So they were going to get thrown out, and I asked if I could analyze them for microplastics. So um, the um, interesting aspect of that is that it's you know a, a certain range of time in a very specific location in Pyrmont Marsh in which these fish were captured. We had already a baseline um, uh, set of data about the fish, their weights, where they were caught, GPS coordinates. So all of that data had been done. And now, on top of that, we can start to couple um, through the protocols that we established um, a way to quantify the amount of microplastics that is in each fish. So um, this was started last year, um, and we had um, sampled just 20 fish in each of three years. And we started looking at the results. Um, this was with a team of high school students that come to Lamont to work in research. And um, the one interesting result we got was that in um, 20, the, the sampling we took from 2013 um, suddenly spiked with uh, fish that were in a very small creek, had been captured in Tidal Creek in Piermont Marsh, which runs pretty much parallel to the Hudson River. And um, most of these fish had large quantities of microbeads in them. And it was the, 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 the one sample set that had this large amount of microbeads. And um, what was great was that the uh, high school student that had been working with us started to think of other patterns that might cause this and immediately hit on um, Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Could that have impacted um, this influx of microbeads? And um, started studying the aerial photographs of the um, of the marsh at just after the hurricane. And um, so we see evidence of a large, what's called a, a it's it's a Phragmites is a reed that's out there and it's called the frag rack when the storm just pushed all of this debris and stuff and it's right along Tiger Creek. So we were, we're just keeping on this project to explore it further because it's very rare to have um, this particular collection of fish over a period of time. So we're pursuing it each year and these high school students will get a chance to um, see how the data creates patterns. The year prior to that, we um, were testing our protocols and we started to use um, shellfish that you purchase from the grocery store. I've got mussels from Maine, I got uh, oysters from Long Island, I had shrimp from various countries, uh, and um, I even picked up some canned clams off the grocery or um, that claimed they were from China. Microplastics in all of it, all of it. None of it was pristine. So these are filter feeders. They really can't choose what they're going to eat. So there's plastics in them. And so now students are asking not if there are going to be plastics in shrimp, that whether they are farmed or wild, but whether farmed or wild shrimp um, make a difference. And um, so Roman Lowe, who was the young researcher on that study that he created, um, found that um, farm shrimp actually um, had less plastics than wild shrimp. Um, and that was out of shrimp that came from Argentina. So we're just trying to see what types of plastics they are. Microplastics are three types. They are either um, secondary fragmented plastics that have been um, coming out in the laundry through um, regular washing, the fibers that come off of your fleece clothing. Pretty much most of the clothing now is made with um, 
synthetic fibers of nylon and polyester. And that's actually what China had been doing with our recycled plastic, is repurposing that into uh, fibers. So the, um, the uh, primary plastics, the microbeads, are um, going to have a ban that is now in effect, it says it this year, right? Yeah, this summer. <clears throat> this summer. However, what the Obama administration missed on that legislation was it was targeted for cosmetics. So the microbeads that are put in facial washes, the microbeads that are put in toothpaste, those are the cosmetic uses of these um, small abrasives. What was missed, and almost purposely, were the industrial uses of, of microplastic beads. And that is used in polishing, which um, when we started looking at the microbeads in these small fish in 2013, uh, the next place that we're going to research is whether or not there are marinas that polish the hulls of boats using microplastic beads. Um, so that legislation misses the industrial uses of microbeads, unfortunately. So, any questions? Yes, ma'am. I just want to ask um, if, with all the research that's been going on, has there been um, an elevated level of conversation around the intersection of climate change with what's happening with plastics? So if we think about what you were just talking about, where you know the fish came out of the, the, the stream, or, um, we're seeing a lot of that. We just had the Riverkeeper Suite, which was one of the largest, it is the largest, it's 2,200 volunteers of 125 different sites up and down the Hudson River. And the largest amount of, of garbage that they're seeing is, is small pieces of styrofoam, small pieces of broken plastic, which is, so I, the, the question is, is we've seen a lot more garbage around our community because of heavy rains and that stuff ends up in the sewer system, that stuff then ends up in the river. So I'm just wondering if, if you've been hearing more about climate change and, and it's an, an, an elevated, I guess, effect of what we're seeing with plastic. I haven't done specific research on the correlation. Um, <clears throat> however, one of the one of the things that I have been researching is. Um, these are polymers that have tremendous amount of energy inherent in them. These bonds of, of molecules are um, actually a resource. So what I think will hopefully happen in terms of, this is a petroleum-based product, and um, actually from what I was reading, um, plastic packaging is the second highest use of petroleum um, than second to transportation. So um, just packaging alone. But um, getting back to your question, I'm trying to understand, it. are you talking about things like storm surge and um, storms and the movement it, it's of just plastic? I think, um, you know, I, I think that more people are, are, are adopting or accepting that climate change, or I think they're calling it now climate crisis is, is real. Um, and it's all the intersection points with all the things that are going on from an environmental perspective and all the various different types of policies that are now being written or lobbied for at least um, and how that you know might elevate the conversation. And, and climate crisis still a lot of people are, they don't want to talk about that and it's, um, you know, you're fighting two battles now. So you're fighting against plastic pollution yeah. and the waste of fossil fuels and, and things like that. And in addition to that, so it's kind of like, I, I don't know where it's going, and I don't know if it's been elevated because of that. Yeah, so I just want to add a couple intersection points, too. Um, one, of course, is that plastics are made from fossil fuels. So the estimation is if we do nothing, about 17% of our, um, you know, all of our, our uh, fossil fuel use is going to go to plastics. Um, there's also an issue locally with the storm surges, which is that as your plastics, particularly your plastic bags and the film packaging, as it gets washed out um, into our sewage system where it eventually ends up in our waterways, it's getting clogged. Um, so it's a big cause of localized flooding. So that is a big deal for coastal communities. 
Like, for example, Bangladesh was one of the first places to ban plastic bags. They did it in 1998, and the reason was because they had these floods that submerged two-thirds of the country. Uh, and when they studied it, they realized that one of the major causes was because plastic was clogging their storm drains. So when we talk about things like Irene and Sandy, we certainly don't want to let something like a cheap plastic bag be exacerbating the local impacts for coastal communities. Um, and I think part of this, too, is when we talk holistically about ocean protection, um, a lot of times it gets broken down. So there are the sort of ocean acidification people, and then there are the plastic people, um, and then there are sort of the loss of wildlife people. But overall, if you are any sort of marine species, now you're facing you know, danger on all sides. So when we talk about shellfish, of course we're talking about plastic pollution, but we're also talking about ocean acidification and climate change and all of these other issues. So it's, you know, it's exacerbating and we don't know how plastic is totally impacting the loss of species, but we know that we're going to see species loss from both climate change and plastic, um, and we're hoping that it doesn't significantly um, exponentially increase it, I think, at this point. The, um, I guess my question is, what options are there locally and globally for finding uses for the discarded plastic? We were talking about glass not being um, melted down and used to make new bottles. But glass can be ground up and used as aggregate with asphalt for pavements and sidewalks as well, for concrete. Is there any research or um, investigation of how we can take all this plastic and have a function besides making park benches and things like that. Sure. Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think the key there was all this plastic. Um, because it's the same thing with glass. Like, yes, you can grind it up and you can use it in construction or to fill landfills. Uh, but the two things are still going to be making new glass bottles. Um, so ultimately, that's a huge issue. And for the amount of glass we're using, we don't really have the construction purpose because we need to come up with something more useful. And it's the same thing for a lot of the single-use plastics. So plastic bags, styrofoam, straws, essentially not even recyclable. Um, there's really nothing you could turn them into. For things like your PET bottles, a lot of times they're getting used for stuff like plastic pellets, um, which can be useful or construction material. You can technically make things out of them, but for the amount of plastic we're using and the need for that, there's a big disparity there. Um, so we just aren't at the point where you can make a plastic bottle out of a plastic bottle, and until we're at that point, we're going to be using new plastics to make it. Um, also, there is um, there there is movement about a new paradigm of thinking around how we're using packaging. So um, one of the um, conferences I went to, uh, a gentleman that was a CEO of a company called TerraCycle is actually making some pretty big headway in working with multinational corporations like um, Parker and & Gamble um, and Walmart and a whole host of huge corporations based in the United States, but are also seeing on the horizon that their plastic shampoo bottles aren't going to get purchased if people are starting to get nervous or allergic to buying plastic. And um, what we have are, we're on the cusp of trying to come up with um, literally a new paradigm that closes the loop of plastic. So, you know, nature has a closed loop system. There is no waste in nature. And we are um, needing to think in terms of, of that concept. So TerraCycle is going to be rolling out a, a new um, endeavor. And it's, um, the rollout starts this spring. And it's May 21st in New York, in which you don't own the package. Just like a milk bottle at one point, then some of us remember when we returned our milk bottles. But um, they're wanting to follow along those lines so that if you buy a bottle of Tide, you don't own the bottle. It goes back. And now that the um, innovation around UPS and FedEx and so forth, I mean, it's all one of the best transportation systems in the 
world are these package delivery systems, thanks to Amazon. And oh, by the way, Amazon is on board with this as well. Um, you would get, put the bottle back in the box that it came in along with your shampoo and everything else, and it would go back to a corporation that refills it and then sends it back to you. So these are some of the um, really strong, innovative ideas about the use of the plastic packaging, which I found very exciting. And you can kind of see what they're, what they're up to um, on their website. It's called TerraCycle. Um, but I think one of the things we, as a society, we've got to learn is literally being allergic to throwing away plastic, being, being sensitive about what they were saying in the film, um, and it's almost at every turn. I mean, pushing away the little half and half containers at the diner and asking for a you know, silver container of milk for your coffee. I mean, there's just, it's endless, but if, if, they, if the consumers aren't starting to make those kinds of concerns visible and known, um, <clears throat> there won't be any reason for a corporation to change their model. So um, right now, as the film said, we're responsible for dealing with pretty much their problem of their packaging. So. Um, sorry, can I just add one thing sure. to that too? Um, so just on like a things we can do side, one of the bills that did not pass this year, we were trying to get in the budget, is something called EPR, it's Extended Producer Responsibility for Packaging. So what it essentially means is that, um, you know, of course taxpayers and municipalities have forever been responsible for doing the recycling and the solid waste disposal. Um, and the goal of this would be to make large companies, including places like Blue Apron and Amazon, who use massive amount of packaging for tiny um, goods, uh, would have the financial cost on them, which of course incentivizes things that what a TerraCycle is doing, um, things like improving just general recycling infrastructure, and also just reducing packaging at the source. Um, so that is one of those things that I think a lot of the groups would be working on next year. This has started really small. Um, but of course, industry is resistant to change. There are definitely some people at the forefront, but you know, you probably can't make Coca-Cola do this as a consumer. Um, it would take a lot of us to do that, but we can certainly do it on a smaller scale with voting just for New York State. Um, and from what we've seen, California and New York State have sort of been co-leading this anti-plastics movement. There's a lot of talk about it there. Um, and the hope is sort of just like the microbeads ban that then this can go fast. Um, it was the film Taft, which is a water bottle film that changed my life because there was a scene of someone uh, visiting a cemetery for a relative because of the contamination of the water in that town. So I went on a mission, what can I reduce? And I switched to bar shampoo and bar soap. I carry my container, I have it in the car, where, uh, with a lid, with a spork. So if I go to a restaurant and there's leftover, I use that. I, I've been bringing my own bottle now to get my juices. Um, I switched my mother. My mother needs to use straws, to paper straws. But, and I just found the dental floss that comes in a paper container. Um, and then I was recently, Bid for 2020 has a competition for, I wish it were collaboration and not competition. But one school, I think it was the Harvey School, they fundraised, they got Elky filters, E-L-K-A-Y. They sold um, stainless steel bottles and they did a whole campaign in the school to get the students off um, the plastic bottles. Another school in West, this is all Westchester, started recycling. Another one grew their own food and it was really tremendous what these students were doing. Um, my questions are, I have two or three. One of the things that bothers me is I say people are buying reusable bags. My bags are usually cotton. But a lot of the reusable bags and even the stainless steel bottles, we're still dealing with the, the people who think about disposable and not how long something will last or what we're replacing it with. So I think we have to get back to um, natural materials so that's one of my questions. 
what we're doing instead, and if that's part of the outreach as the legislation is going through. And the other question is whether they have studied plastics in breast milk and amniotic fluid in humans. Do you want to take the second part? I'll take the second part. So, um, no, they have not, there has not been currently any studies of, with humans in that realm. However, there was just recently a study of um, the transfer of nanoplastics in mice from the, um, uh, it was introduced, these were nanoplastics introduced into the, um, the female uh, pregnant mouse. And what was shocking was that it did transfer through the placenta into the fetal mouse and um, was in the, the fetal mouse's organs and system upon birth. So, that's the possibility that is really horrifying is that, yes, these plastics fracture into smaller and smaller particles and they do now are being studied at the nano level and are capable of transfer from um, the gut tissue into the bloodstream and questioning whether or not it could pass the blood-brain barrier. But the, um, according to what I've understood through several research scientists at Milan um, to study uh, microplastic effects um, on humans would require roughly a 10-year study with uh, substantial NIH funding. And right now that does not exist at, at this stage. So uh, they are doing um, animal models at this point. Right, and I'll take the first part. Um, so for the alternatives in the education, that is one of the things that I think the next nine months are going to be primarily about in terms of what's happening on the state level. Um, so number one, we have to get clarification, but it looks like the New York State law bans all plastic bags, including the reusable plastic bags. So you would have to just use a cloth or a cotton. Um, with those, though, you do have to reuse them in order for them to be carbon neutral, right? Um, so the estimation for a cotton bag is you have to use it about a hundred times. You have to use it for a long time. You can't just go to a reusable bag giveaway and feel really good about yourself and put them in your purse and then never use them. Um, so part of it is figuring out what kind of bags people are going to really use. So like, for example, the guy from Chico Bags is up there. Those small foldable bags made of durable material have been really good. Um, and teaching people not to just take them because they're a thing that's free, because uh, that doesn't help anyone. We're basically just changing behavior to taking the free single use to a bunch of free reusables. Um, and instead teaching people, you really only need four bags and keep using them until they're worn out and then move on. Um, and I think there's been a lot of success with that at the municipal level. So like I'm originally from Long Beach on Long Island. They have had a bag fee for the last three years, I believe. And part of their main education was when they first started, they did a lot of reusable bag giveaways, especially for in low income areas, people who are on um, like food assistance, uh, in senior centers, in schools. Uh, and then after that, they kind of stopped because everybody had reusable bags. And it's a nice thing for every Earth Day to come out with 100,000 reusable bags and give them out. Uh, but in the end, it's detrimental because it's just more waste. So it's a balance that we're going to be trying to figure out. We sort of figured it out for the city. Now we're on the state, but 100% a thing to be concerned about. So Rob, your question is next, and we're gonna wrap up soon after that, but I did wanna let folks know that um, C-Town right here in Austining is the first location that I'm aware of in our area where we have a uh, give a bag, take a bag um, for reusable bags that um, has been introduced. So if you're somebody who, like me has a hook that's full of 20 reusable bags and you really only need five, um, you can donate some of them to the C-Town here or if also like me, sometimes you show up unexpectedly in your grocery shopping and you forgot to bring your reusable bag, you can grab one yourself. And I don't know how widespread that will become, but um, mm -hmm. C-Town over on Croton Avenue is the first one that we're up here in Austin. So I have uh, two questions, one for Deborah and one for Jordan. Deborah, when you did your study, uh, did you find any pristine species at all? Or just, or very limited, you know, was there? Yes, I, um, I got tired of shucking oysters, so one day uh, I learned of Dollar Oyster Night at some bar down in Soho or somewhere, 
And these oysters were from uh, Washington State, uh, Wilson Oysters. And I know Washington State because I've lived there and I was actually at that location one time in my life. Almost every single one of those oysters was pristine. I don't know why. I don't know if it's the, the sheltering of that particular location, but that was one uh, species uh, which uh, it, it surprised me. But glass. But I know in other countries, especially in the Middle East, they take bottles like a Coke glass Coke bottle in its original form and just reuse the bottle. It goes back to Coke and they they clean it and refill it. Uh, why isn't that uh, um, being done here? That is what we should be doing here. Uh, the real problem is that we have brown glass, we have clear glass, and we have green glass. Um, so what you have to do is, number one, bring it back to a distribution center, and then separate it by color, and then they would have to clean it out. And that's a lot of steps, and I think it's definitely where we're heading. Um, and we definitely want to start some pilots with places like local sustainable wineries and local breweries to sort of get that going. Um, but right now what happens is you mash up the glass all in one and then you go to make bottles. And nobody who makes bottles wants that because you're not going to have a you know mixed colored bottle. You need a perfect Corona bottle or a perfect Heineken bottle. Um, so I think we have to start getting away from that for sure. Um, but right now that's one of the biggest impediments is you wouldn't be able to do it curbside and you'd have to separate by color. But how do they do it overseas? That I don't know. I think that um, you know maybe it's just one color, and maybe it's not curbside. You take it down to a distribution center. So that's like, for example, with the five cents or the ten cents for the bottle deposit, that would be a big thing. Is that you would take it back to a separate distribution center instead of just putting it in your curbside where everything gets matched up. I think up. I know the answer to that. Yeah. There's a lot of hand sorting in other countries. Our you know, the last country that is accepting our plastic right now is India. May I have your attention, please? The library will be closing in a half hour. Please note that the computers will be shutting down in about 15 minutes. Please save all your work. Okay. Can you repeat that? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's, it's the cost of labor is very inexpensive, so it can be hand sorted very inexpensively in other locations, unfortunately. I'll tell you, when I lived in Mexico City, in the early 1990s, if you would buy a bottle of soda, um, you could either chug it and hand them back the glass bottle, or they would pour it in a plastic bag with a straw. And that, but they kept their bottles, and they turned their bottles back in. I mean, that was 25 years ago. I don't know if they're still doing that in Mexico, or if they figured out another way to do it, but the street vendors didn't like to take the bottle. I suppose you can pay for it, but that was a college student, so I wasn't going to do that. Um, uh, uh, is, is there any final questions? Young man, yes. Just have a quick question. Um, what, what would you recommend is like the best way to restore the ocean and to like maintain the ocean's like health and like get all the plastic out of the ocean? Just a little. Yeah, um, that's a very big question and a very important one. Um, the answer is partially not to get it out, but just to stop it from ever going in. Yeah. So as you saw in the, we have called these plastic islands, and we've called them, you know, plastic gyres. But the way to really think about them is that they're plastic soup. Once it's in there, you're not getting it back out. So the only thing that we can really do is curb as much as we can. So we know from all of our beach cleanups, there are things, you know, internationally, the same single-use plastics always wash up. It's bottles, it's bottle caps, it's straws, it's utensils, it's plastic bags, it's plastic film. Um, so it's uh, a lot of them are balloons. So for a lot of that stuff, it's stuff that we actually don't generally need in our everyday life. There are sustainable alternatives. Um, and it's just changing consumer behavior over time. Um, and the truth is, we're going to always have plastic. We're, we should have plastic for our IV bags. We shouldn't have plastic bags to carry a plastic water bottle and a plastic pack thing of gum out of our supermarkets. So while it's all of us doing a little bit, it's all of us pushing our elected leaders to do a lot more, and it's those elected leaders pushing businesses to change. Uh, but the truth is, until we're at a point where we're not you know, using however many single-use plastics we're using every day, and just for the next like day or two, every time you get something that's individually wrapped in plastic, just note it and think of how much plastic that is. What we have to do is just not do that, because once it's in, we're not going to get it back out.
I'd like to add um, onto that because we haven't touched at all on the fashion industry. And one of the things that the fashion industry desperately wants you to do is buy new clothes every season. <laughs> and um, this is also something that uh, has to be addressed because I, when National Geographic asked me what has how has this changed your behavior, I told them I've stopped buying new clothes. I really now buy secondhand clothes, mm -hmm. and. Um, Mostly it's because the amount of waste that is going into clothing and what ends up in microfibers and in landfills is stunning. Uh, the average human being on the planet, it's averaged over throughout, throws away 81 pounds of clothing a year. And it's simply the, driven by fashion industry and trying to get you to feel guilty about what you're wearing you know, if it's three or four years old. So um, the, um, the thing that is interesting um, that TerraCycle is trying to do is also have things age gracefully, have them age with character. And it came to mind um, the Japanese philosophy of wabi-sabi, which is something grows old and it has character. This water bottle, the reason why I have it up here, this is seven years old. And I keep it because it's plastic, but it's my water bottle. And it it lasts and I'm not gonna ever throw it away, but you know, it is durable and sturdy. So if we can start looking at purchasing things with a long range purpose and an intention to have it have a moth hole or two it, and it's perfectly fine. Um, those are kind of the concepts that do require a society to take on as sort of a new understanding of how we integrate our life on this planet sustainably. In a moment, I'm going to ask our panelists to give us any final thoughts that you have or any points that you didn't get to that didn't come up organically in today's conversation, but I did have a, a couple of final um, uh, comments to raise. Uh, for one, we had a screening sponsor this evening, which I neglected to mention in our opening, and that is Riverkeeper, our own uh, Austin's own Riverkeeper, who does uh, so many wonderful things here in Austin. We mentioned the uh, Riverkeeper Suite, which was last weekend, where they found all kinds of plastic and other weird things in our uh, Hudson River tributaries. Um, and uh, I also wanted to mention on your way out, remind you that there is the petition for you to be able to sign for the expansion of the bottle, uh, the recycling act that they're looking to put forward in New York State that um, Jordan was speaking about a little earlier. And I also want to draw your attention to, I'm sure you noticed, there is a very brightly colored piece of artwork here up on the stage. And Janice, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, Janice has put together this fish, which is eating uh, single-use plastic bags in it. And uh, we, I first saw it at Earth Day, so I guess that was when, when you first unveiled it, right? Um, and so uh, we'll, have, we'll have to see where this fish ends up next time, and if, if we can find a home for it where people do, to, can collect some of our uh, plastic bags, because I think one of the, the, the underlying kind of, a little bit depressing, but uh, the motivations for some of these uh, bottle recycling and why it's such an effective program is not because recycling is the most amazing thing in the world, but because it's a lot better than litter. Just a pretty low bar. <laughs> uh, but plastic bags um, are certainly, you can see there's so many initiatives for us to try and uh, reduce the number of plastic bags that are going into our waterways and the sewer drains into our waterways. And so um, thank you, Janice, for um, providing us with another uh, uh, very highly visible um, uh, local reminder of the, the need to uh, reduce and recycle the plastic bags. And so, with that, um, I, I, Deborah and Jordan, if you have any final thoughts or um, anything you want us to be aware of that's coming up, please share with us now. Um, I will just very quickly say, um, so I know that Bill touched on this a little bit, uh, but one of the things is, at first we all started talking about plastic bags like 10 years ago, right? And then we all started talking about styrofoam, and now we all talk about straws, and next we'll talk about balloons, and then after that we'll talk about cutlery. Uh, but one of the big things that's happening globally, and there's sort of a push to do this, New York City just introduced a bill to do it, is to finally look at this stuff comprehensively. Um, so it's to you know hold businesses accountable for the amount of plastic that they're wasting, to look at all the single-use plastics we use, and figure out what can be sustainably replaced, what can actually be recycled, and what can't. Um, and instead of having it on all of our shoulders every day with every purchase to make a better decision, to just make it easy for us. 
uh, because I think that everybody in this room, in a lot of ways, right, we just heard about, I have my water bottle, and then I have my bag, and then I have my reusable straw, and I have this, and I have that. And it's really important to make that effort. Uh, but it's a lot to ask of people. And there are some things where you just can't avoid the packaging. Um, so starting to look at this comprehensively, the EU just started doing it, we're just starting to do it, but I think it's something to look for for the next couple of years, and if there's any local initiatives, just try to support them, because it's, you know, it's easy to not take a bag, it's a little bit hard to figure out how to take, take out out of restaurants with, with nothing. Um, so it's, we're sort of figuring it out, but I think that there's going to be a lot of innovation and a lot of interesting ideas in the next couple of years. And just to couple on that innovation. I am seeing the plastics, I keep in touch with uh, the um, Plastics um, Trade Association to find out how sensitive they are to this issue and they are addressing it and they are looking at um, chemical compounds that could possibly degrade, biodegrade. They are trying to um, address this issue and I think they know that on the horizon as awareness grows, people are going to become more and more sensitive about purchasing products that, that normally nobody thought about the plastic packaging. So I'm heartened by the fact that the chemical industry is looking at this um, and trying to um, analyze, even um, from an enzyme standpoint, whether or not the existing plastics can break down the hydrocarbons of, of the plastics we currently have into um, you know, safe molecules that aren't going to harm nature. Wait. Sorry, one more thing I meant to add. They talked a lot about American Chemistry Council, who we've been fighting for 10 years on this. And I just wanted to say, um, for the last couple campaigns, um, they started to back off a little bit, and I think it's because they, like all of us, see the writing on the wall. So they fought really hard against New York City banning styrofoam like four years ago. They even sued them over it. Suffolk County just banned it. They didn't even show up to the hearings. <laughs> uh, when we were working on the microbees ban, they fought tooth and nail in Albany and in New York City to stop it. And then once a bunch of other counties and states did it on the federal level, the business kind of threw up their hands and went like, all right, as long as it's uniform, we can you know, have the same formulation for Oregon and New Jersey, we're fine. Um, so whatever we're doing, it's working, and they're backing yeah. off a little bit. Uh, so just keep it up. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. We will be seeing you back here June 6th. It says it on your bookmark, so take your bookmark with you, and that'll be your reminder. Join us, join us for Transmilitary. And uh, yes, was there one last question? If somebody wants to become a friend of the series, do they have to wait until next month? No, they can do it right now <laughs> as you leave. Stop by. There's a table on one side of the, of, uh, the aisle that has a beautifully decorated box with butterflies, and you can become a friend of the series right there today for just a suggested donation of $20. And then on the other side of the aisle as you walk out is the petition you can sign for the expansion of uh, the, uh, the bottle recycling. So uh, take your time as you leave. Uh, and um, anybody from the Documentary Discussion Series Screening Committee, if you could please join our panelists for a photo. Thank you so much. I cannot, it's a hard film to watch. Yes, just a little bit.